Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin tonight with a question. Is it better to have police officers on hand or to remove them almost entirely from mental health calls? An activist group thinks the city should run two programs side by side to find out. The city of San Antonio already setting up a new multidisciplinary response team to respond to mental health calls in the downtown area beginning this spring. Police will already be taking a back seat on this MDR team. An officer won't be responding solo. They'll also be with a mental health clinician and a paramedic. But as Garrett Berger tells us, some think that's still too much. On March 26th, in the midst of what she says was a mental health crisis, Deborah Montez Felder's brother was shot and killed by a San Antonio police officer. What John needed that morning was experienced, specialized intervention and compassionate care and assistance. Montez Felder was one of several people today urging members of the Public Safety Committee to consider an alternative responder model for mental health calls, a civilian team that would not include a police officer. Because if you're going to get police involved, I assure you, you're going to have pretty much the same response. It's an idea a coalition of groups, including Act for SA, had previously pushed for in place of the MDR team. But since that's going forward anyways, Act for SA's executive director says a smaller coalition at least wants the civilian-focused idea to be run simultaneously. It could handle lower priority calls, she says, calling for police support only in rare cases. So that way we can compare the two programs, their effectiveness, their evaluations. Though Councilman Jalen McKee Rodriguez showed support for the idea at today's committee meeting, city staff don't recommend removing law enforcement from mental health calls. Though the deputy city manager suggests it's something they could consider after they see how their MDR team program works out first. If there's a different way that we, we should be handling those calls, we're open to it. We just don't uh, feel that it's safe at this point. And the police chief says the level of officer involvement in these calls will depend on the situation. We don't want any clinicians you know, walking into that where it's a, it's a uh, violent situation. Uh, our goal is to simply keep everybody safe. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Universal City Police making an arrest in connection with a murder in Converse last Thursday. 27-year-old Vaughn Skirvin charged with the murder of 38-year-old Joshua Huron. That shooting happened in the 8800 block of Appaloosa Pass. According to police documents, officers arrested Skirvin at his home after he called 911 and told them that he shot someone in Converse. Police say they found an AK-47 style weapon matching the description of the weapon that was used in that shooting. No motive for the shooting so far has been released. It is not easy to talk about, but when children choose to open up about serious issues, they sometimes do so with youth pastors or parents or other family members. That's why it is crucial that those youth leaders learn how to spot signs of child sex trafficking and how to address them. Courtney Friedman spoke to a ministry leader who just attended an eye-opening training. Evil, just horrible. I have, I have six kids and five grandkids, and my God, just to think about what they're up against. Cibolo Creek Community Church youth volunteer Rick Scheel emotional about what he learned in a youth pastor training session on child trafficking. The digital impact and how these kids are being approached through Snapchat, through Instagram, and they portray themselves as being uh, another youth. And pretty soon they're sucked into a conversation that they can't get out of. The training hosted by Ransomed Life, an organization serving victims and educating the public on prevention. The experts and now the ministries are teaching parents about this, that you can wait to give your child a cell phone, that you can check what's on their cell phone, and that it's okay to take that cell phone away. Never allow a child to have a phone in their bedroom at night. The phone should get locked up. There's nobody they need to talk to at 2 o'clock in the morning. She'll learn to look for red flags in both girls and boys. Receiving packages in the mail from um, unannounced um, people, them uh, having new friends that they that you don't know, they're depressed. It feels like they're hiding something. Those are signs, and we need to be aware of that and and engage that child, engage their parents, and engage in the right way. Do you do like most parents? Do you just freak out? Well, you can't do that. Children need to have a safe place to go, no matter what, to bring any situation. They're not going to get. Uh, in trouble. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Now anyone with questions or concerns can always turn to Ransom Life for guidance. Youth pastors interested in these trainings can contact Ransom Life on their website. We have the link 
at ksat.com. In just 24 hours after announcing his run for governor of Texas, Beto O'Rourke made a stop in San Antonio this morning. O'Rourke is the first 2022 Texas gubernatorial Democratic candidate to stop here in the Alamo City. He lost a close race for Senate in 2018 against Senator Ted Cruz, then later ran for president in 2020. And now he hopes to turn Texas blue. O'Rourke says his top priorities include voters' rights, women's reproductive rights, and gun rights calling the current constitutional carry law extremist and dangerous. But today, he made a push for health care in rural communities. We have got to expand Medicaid in this state, especially at a time that the federal government is paying 95 cents on the dollar for care. That's how we attract doctors to rural Texas. It's how we keep rural hospitals open. And under Greg Abbott's watch, 24 rural hospitals have closed so far. Meantime, at a press conference on Monday in Floorsville, Governor Greg Abbott said that he welcomes the challenge from O'Rourke, adding that he is skeptical Democrats will win over Hispanic voters in Texas. A new at six with Nelson Wolf set to retire after 20 years as a Bear County judge. Two candidates have announced they're in the running. A third is still deciding. Others have until December 13th whether or not they want to jump in this race. What immediately stands out about these candidates so far is how diverse they are. An Asian American, a Latina, and a Latino. Jesse DeGriado says they also represent years of experience in public service. After more than 25 years on the bench, focusing on children and families in crisis, the first to announce their candidacy for county judge was Peter Sakai. I want to bring my expertise, my leadership, my integrity over to Commissioner's Court. A former prosecutor and attorney, Ina Minhaitis has been a state representative since 2005. I've been house trained. I, I say that in the way where I got to the Texas House of Representatives. Still considering the race, former San Antonio mayor and the president of the SAISD school board, Ed Garza, an urban planner both at heart and by training. That's what I like to get involved with, uh, the big picture visions that transform lives, that transform places, uh, and, and most importantly, the people. If elected county judge, each of the candidates will bring their own histories of public service to the job. And bringing with them what they learned. I had to develop the ability to listen intently and with empathy to two sides of a legal dispute. It's talking to those affected, those that say, I need help, those that say, this is working, the, what's not working. It's about collaboration, building powerful partnerships. Garza says he'll reach a decision by around Thanksgiving, while the other candidates who've announced so far are looking ahead at next year's March primary and the November general election. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Baptist Health System is bringing a new hospital to Bernie. Right now, people who live there have to come to San Antonio for hospital treatment. Japhne Gray spoke with city and hospital officials along with people who live in Bernie and all say this multi-million dollar move is something that growing city needs. It's difficult having a loved one in the hospital as it is. Um, it's more difficult whenever your family can't be close. We don't currently have a hospital where if you need to be admitted, you can stay in the community that you live in. It's a dilemma that's been echoed across Bernie. I have that drive into Leon Springs or San Antonio. My mother who lives in Bernie, she's all over Stone Oak and the medical center. Yeah, an ambulance ride and all that was not fun. The city and Baptist Health System started talking about adding a hospital last year. Look across the market, it's, it's probably got the largest um, you know, delta between where people live and where they end up for health care. For level one medical care, like extended hospital stays or trauma care, people will still have to drive or be taken to cities like San Antonio. But for acute care, it's just the drive up the road at the intersection of I-10 and State Highway 46. Our goal is to be fast, efficient, accessible. In addition to beds and an emergency room, the hospital campus would feature other benefits. Outpatient services, medical imaging, I'm certainly going to and work with our affiliated physician network to bring physicians to the community as well. Best case scenario, this $50 million project is expected to be completed in the next few years. Officials say they hope to have it open by the end of 2023 or early 2024. In Bernie, Jaffe Gray, KSAT 12 News. Take a live look outside with live cam tonight, 74 degrees. 
It is warm. <laughs> we are waiting for a cool down. For November, Sarah. yeah. Well, you'll only have to wait a little bit more than a day or so because we're expected to get a cold front tomorrow right around midnight. And boy, was it warm today. 81 degrees for the afternoon high. That's 10 degrees above average. We did have some fog early this morning. We'll have some more fog tomorrow morning as well. The aquifer is down two tenths of a foot over the past 24 hours. Pollen count not too shabby. Molds, pigweed, and ragweed present, but in low amounts. So here's what we're going to talk about in the four forecast coming up. We've got one more warm day, but that cold front is on the way. It'll make it windy and cooler on Thursday and a lunar eclipse this week. The longest one in centuries. We'll talk about that coming up after the rig. Welcome back. Here's what we're working on for you tonight on the night beat. Thanksgiving, as we all know, is more than a week away, and you know what that means. Lots of holiday get togethers. But here's the thing. Doctors are worrying that that's going to cause yet another COVID spike. So tonight we're going to discuss how you can celebrate safely this holiday season. Also, a massive lawsuit against opioid makers now settled and Bear County is supposed to get millions of dollars. The question is, how will that money be spent? We're going to get answers for you tonight on the Night Beat. We're going to see you for that, those stories and so much more tonight at 10. All right, see you then. Thanks, Stephanie. Mothers Against Drunk Driving cheering for a new part of the federal infrastructure bill. This group says that it provides a fighting chance against that deadly problem. Our Samuel King joins us now. Sam, the newly signed law puts automakers on the clock, so to speak. That's right, Stephen Meyer. They have to make technology that detects intoxicated drivers standard in all new vehicles in just a matter of years. Now, that could include sensors or cameras that can detect a driver's head or eyes. Technology has existed for years and is already available as an option on many vehicles and more every day. Now, the law's passage comes after a years long fight for MAD. Aziza Salama says San Antonio has one of the worst drunk driving problems in the country and every tool is needed to fight back. You know, it's not just the victim, it's the victim's family, it's their co-workers, it's their friends, it's their neighbors, it's the police officers that arrived on the scene, the first responders that maybe worked on the family members. Why go through all of that trauma when we have the ability to save lives? Experts say the requirements aren't likely to include breathalyzers in vehicles because that would be far too intrusive and impractical for most drivers. Monitoring technology could also prevent other crashes that are caused by drowsy or distracted driving. Federal government will now come up with the new rules and give automakers time to implement them. And those vehicles with those mandated safety technology features could roll off the assembly line by 2026. Let's take a look at this evening's uh, traffic, and we've been talking about this one. This is on Highway 90 westbound approaching uh, Loop 410. You can see a row of flashing lights there. There's a crash there on the shoulder. You can see the flashing lights there too. And also this, uh, some of this is just uh, the volume we see in the evening, but of course the crash is not helping matters. So right now, if you're heading from 35 to loop 1604, 17 minutes, and then there's some more delays once you get right there past uh, 1604. So watch out for that again. We'll give you another look at that here in a second. Uh, this is getting better, but we still have some slowdowns here on the west side. This is loop 1604 at State Highway 151, still down to 14 miles per hour north Brown. There's a crash last hour at Calabra Road, and that's still affecting things. Taking a wider look at things, we're pretty busy. You know, as more people are back to work and school this fall, this map does look a lot different this time of year than it normally uh, did, it did a year ago, for instance. Uh, still some busy traffic there, including on 35. Uh, this is 15 to 19 minutes northbound or inbound and southbound between Loop 410 and downtown. And then we have a crash there at Nogalitos in 35, so that's causing some delays northbound 18 minutes coming from the southwest side. And give you one more look at uh, this, again, Highway 90 uh, westbound just past 16, uh, excuse me, just past 410 approaching 1604. Slow traffic this evening, guys. Yeah, I hope that clears up soon. That's yes. a mess. Big Thanks, backup Sam. out there. All right, Sky 12. Oh, oh, look here. Over downtown. I believe that is the Hotel Palacio del uh, Rio. Uh huh. It is. As, Lit up like a Christmas tree. Yeah, and the Christmas tree is in town. It's at Travis Park. That's right. We know that. It just be... doesn't have the lights and all that good stuff. Yeah, on. that's coming in the next few weeks, and hopefully some cooler weather to go along with that. 
making it feel festive, Sarah? We are going to have some cooler weather over the next 48 hours or so. Getting a cold front late tomorrow night. We'll talk about that in a second, but a lot of uh, information about something that people have been asking me about. The partial lunar eclipse this week, early Friday morning. We're talking maximum eclipse happening at 3 o'clock in the morning, okay? But this is going to be the longest partial eclipse, the longest lunar eclipse in more than a century. It'll begin right at 1.18 in the morning with maximum eclipse happening right at 3.02. You'll be able to see that red tint to the moon as the moon will be in the Earth's shadow and then the partial eclipse will be ending uh, by 5 o'clock in the morning. By that time, Friday morning, we're going to be in the 40s with skies slowly clearing. So we'll have to see those skies clear at just the right time in order to view that lunar eclipse. But I think it is going to be possible in many places around San Antonio and winds will be from the north. Well, it was anything but chilly today. We got up to 81 degrees this afternoon for the high temperatures. That's 10 degrees above the seasonable average, near 90 in Del Rio, 90 degrees in Catula, and temperatures struggled to get out of the 70s in Kerrville, but still a warm day. We did start the day with fog, and we'll start the day with fog tomorrow morning as well. You can see where our cold front is right now, working its way across the northern Rockies. Texas is actually the warmest spot on the map across the United States. That front is going to be moving through tomorrow at midnight. So again, one more day tomorrow of warmth and mugginess in the air. It will still be in the 80s around San Antonio tomorrow in the afternoon. But that front will be moving through Texas tomorrow and making it here at midnight. As far as rain goes, it does not look good for rainfall. I think this is a fairly accurate representation. There could be an isolated shower or even an isolated storm, especially off to the east. But we're not going to see a lot of rain from this cold front. Instead, one thing you'll really notice is how windy it will be on Thursday. So tomorrow we could see wind gusts up to 20, 25 miles per hour. But once that front moves through near midnight, we could potentially see wind gusts of up to 40 miles per hour in the mid morning hours of Thursday. So think about those outdoor Christmas decorations. Uh, think about your light patio furniture, your trash can. You might be fishing it down the street if you uh, leave that out there in the early morning hours of Thursday. And with those windy conditions from the north, our temperatures are going to fall as well. Tomorrow will be near 82 degrees, but Thursday our high temperature should only be 63. Friday will only be looking at highs in the 60s as well. A bit more mild in the weekend before that front. Another front moves through uh, early Monday. Monday as well, knocking our high temperatures down. But again, tomorrow is still going to be warm. We will not be seeing that cold front until after uh, 10 p.m. until about midnight. We'll start off the day with patchy fog, 62 degrees, much like today. That fog, those low clouds will clear by lunch. Will be mostly sunny, 76, 82 for the high temperature tomorrow. South winds 10 to 20, gusting up to about 30 miles per hour. And then right around 10 until about 2 o'clock in the morning, there could be an isolated shower with that front arriving, and then temperatures will tumble. We'll wake up near 52 on Thursday, 63 for the high temperature on Thursday with those windy conditions. Chilliest morning over the next seven days is going to be Friday morning. Again, at the time of the eclipse, <laughs> when we'll see temperatures in the 40s, waking up uh, to the 40s, but topping off in the 60s on Friday, mild over the weekend. And then that other front is going to be a weaker front, too. Only an isolated shower or storm possible for that. Thanksgiving, it's getting into clearer view. Uh, we'll be able to refine that forecast for you. Looks like there's a small chance for rain now, but of course, that's a little bit in the future. So, Steve, Myra. All right, we'll see. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Could it be another first for UTSA in what has been a season of first grade? It's been unprecedented so far, and under Jeff Trailer, you couldn't ask for anything more to happen to this great team that he has built. When we come back here, there's one big opponent still to play, and actually two total, but the biggest opponent is yet to come this Saturday. And Jimbo Fisher still trying to convince Aggie fans he's not going anywhere. Coming up.
The 15th ranked UTSA Roadrunners are 10-0 with two games left in their unprecedented regular season, but it may be all for naught if they don't beat the University of Alabama at Birmingham this Saturday in the Alamo Dome. UAB has owned the Roadrunners, winning four straight since returning in 2017, and while they stand at 7-3 overall, they're 5-1 in conference, so winning on Saturday would give UAB a shot at the Conference USA West Division title and a chance to play for the Conference USA Championship if they win out against UTEP. For the Roadrunners, they're playing for their first ever Western Division title in school history, which they can secure with a victory on Saturday. Another in a long list of firsts for this program this season, including keeping their undefeated season intact. It's the same question every week. You know, there's, it's why there's only three of us left. It's really hard to do. <laughs> uh, the odds are <laughs> most don't make it, right? So, uh, but you can't, you cannot think that way. You just can't. Um, I've heard people say before, you know, it'd be better off for them to go ahead and lose and get it over with. Well, okay, we'll try that next year. We'll get we'll get that out of the way early. How about that? This game, uh, it, it has a lot of weight to it. And all my guys, they're doing everything that they need to do, extra film and extra, and extra curricular, everything that they need to do as far as the treatment-wise, getting extra treatment, studying in the playbook. Every guy is just it's, it's, it's up a game because we're in the back end of the season, so everybody, everybody's really tightening down. And I really feel the energy throughout the locker room. All right, good to hear from Spencer there. The UJC Road Runners will be four and a half point favorites, and they also Blazers Saturday at two thirty in the Dome. Now that the chances of the fighting Texas Aggies of winning the SEC West and making the college football playoffs have slipped away, concerns have heightened again in College Station about the future of Jimbo Fisher and Aggie Land, especially since the LSU Tigers, who the maroon and white finished their regular season against, have not named a successor for their head coach, Ed Ogeron, and especially since the man who brought Fisher to Texas A&M, Scott Woodward, is now the athletic director at LSU. Fisher tried again to calm the Aggie faithful about not jumping ship. We're going to recruit an unbelievable class this year, okay? So I'm either the dumbest human being on God's earth, okay, who's going to recruit all these guys to A&M so I can go across over here and go play against them, okay? If I, do, if I did that, you ought, to, you ought to say, that's the dumbest human being. I don't want him to be my coach. But I want to be at A&M. I plan on being at A&M. I ain't going to know. I don't want to be nowhere else. I love being right here. There you go, Gavincha. Another worry for Aggie fans that his record $96 million contract contains no buyout clause if he wants to leave, only if he gets fired. With just two games left of the regular season, Texas head coach Steve Sarkeesian told us that Casey Thompson will be a starting quarterback going forward, even though Hudson Card did get some playing time in the 57-56 overtime loss to Kansas. But what about Cuero's Jordan Whittington? Will he be able to play in the final two games after breaking his collarbone and the Horns lost to Oklahoma? I think there is a chance uh, Jordan Whittington can play this weekend. Um, you know, we'll monitor that. I mean, it, it'd be great to have Jordan back. I mean, he's one, he's an exceptional football player. Uh, two, he's a great leader on our football team, and he's been one since the day I arrived. This guy's been tremendous for us. Um, so if we can get him back, that would be great. The Horns could certainly use another wide receiver when they travel to West Virginia on Saturday to face the Mountaineers. This has not been a good season, but they can still be bowl eligible if they win out. We'll see what happens. So Jimbo Fisher's a little on the fence. <laughs> yeah, love that guy. <laughs> love that guy. I know, me yeah, too. Yeah. I always love some Jimbo <laughs> sound bites. Our KSAT Q&A up next. Homelessness is a big issue in our community, but it's not accurate to call Haven for Hope a homeless shelter. It's a transitional center. It's a place where people can come to change their lives, and it is certainly a unique way to treat those people who don't have an address in our community. But they're also going through a transition of their own, and that is with a new president and CEO, Kim Jeffries, who comes from Brighton, and she joins us now on our KSAT Q&A. Hey, Kim, thank you so much for being here. Why, for why did you decide Haven for Hope was the next step in your career? Uh, you know, I grew up, uh, my grandfather was a pastor, and so we grew up kind of with that servant's heart mentality that you get use the gifts that you have been given to help others. And so I had an opportunity to do that at Brighton and it got to a point where it was time to leave and pass the torch over there. Um, and there was a, a little bit of divine intervention in, in me coming over to Haven. Um, and so had an opportunity um, and just happened to talk to the right person at the right time and um, then interviewed and, and after touring Haven, um, and the feel and the energy that is at this place, um, there's there's something special and magical about it that I just had to be a part of. 
You know, Haven really has become such a, a key part of this community. They're they're involved in so many different things other than just providing mm -hmm. shelter, which is is huge. But for you in this new role, is there a, a goal that's top of mind for you or a top priority that you're really hoping you can accomplish? Yeah, I think long term, it's, it's really just the sustainability. You know, what's unique about Haven is it's a hand up. It's not a hand out. Um, and so when somebody walks through the door, they don't just get a roof over their head. They get, you know, help with getting ID if they need it. They get help with substance abuse if they need it, mental health services, job employment. There's a kennel here for their pets. It's, you know, everything in one place, um, which, you know, they don't have to go anywhere. It's removing those obstacles. And so it's had a huge impact on the San Antonio community. And so I think fi figuring out how to make sure Haven is here for the long term, well beyond whatever my tenure is here as president and CEO. What does that look like? I mean, obviously, Bill Greehy was instrumental in setting up Haven for Hope. He has been, you know, instrumental in the sustainability of Haven. Does it does sustainability mean more money from the city and county? Does it mean more private donations? I mean, have, are you able to put your hand arms around what that means for Haven? You know, only two days officially yeah. into the job. <laughs> Day two, um, I think it's actually a combination of all of those things. So I think it's, you know, figuring out, you know, where are their opportunities, even nationally. This is a national model for how to, you know, work with a population who is experiencing homelessness. You know, there's the other cities you hear about them experiencing, you know, just uh, being inundated with people, you know, on the streets. And that's not happening in San Antonio because of Haven for Hope. So what are those national opportunities for, for funding that can turn this into a national model for others? Uh, you know, state and federal, obviously looking at those are local funding and then obviously private donations as a part of that. So just really looking at a whole mix of uh, diversified revenue streams that will be here for the long term. Cause you know, we, we, we do depend on the kindness of strangers, but we need to have other opportunities um, to bring in some revenue that's a little more sustainable. Uh, you know, it seems like homelessness, people experiencing homelessness, it's it's become a much broader conversation. A big part of working with the homeless population involves everyone else who is not homeless, who is not facing those challenges for us to really address this as a community. So do you think there is something unique to San Antonio when it comes to our homeless population, the resources that we have and the challenges that you all face in the work that you do? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, one of the things I love about San Antonio is it's a big, small town. And so there's this sense of community here. And you can you can see that, obviously, in how Haven was, you know, founded by Mr. Greehy and the city and the county working collaboratively to say we've got to address this in a more holistic manner. And so I, I think that's really special about the San Antonio community and how it comes together. And Haven doesn't do this alone. You know, there's hundreds of partners um, that, ha that work with Haven to bring all these services to these folks. Um, and that's what really is unique about what San Antonio does and how they come together to support this population. You know, and homelessness is, you know, it doesn't discriminate. So, you know, it's the, the person who lost their job and, you know, then lost their apartment and ended up living in their car, you know, after two months and didn't, you know, expect that that to happen. So the faces of homeless are, are different than or more diverse than I think people realize. You know, we right now we have 166 children in the shelter um, and so the, in our transformational center. And so their families are working to uh, find, uh, you know, and our case managers are working with them to find permanent housing so they can move out and, and start, you know, a new life and a new chapter. Yeah, we here at case, case Ed have done a couple of stories on the homeless situation in San Antonio. And, and that's what I was struck by is how many families with children that, that you're seeing there. If somebody's at home right now and they want to help, what is the best way for them to help Haven right here, right now? So there's a variety of ways. I think the, the first thing, obviously, if they want to make a donation, they can go to havenforhope.org and make a donation. There's also a list on there of all of the things that we need. We're about to get into this winter time. You know, we're all going to be warm, sitting around a table at Thanksgiving and over the holidays. Um, you know, but people who are experiencing homelessness need um, things in our courtyard and even in our transitional living center. So jackets and scarves and hats and gloves. Um, and the number one, one request um, for people who are 
experiencing homelessness sucks. Um, and the second is underwear. So new things. So in-kind donations, we take those in our donation center here at Haven for Hope during the week. So you can look at the hours for donation on our website as well. If people want to volunteer, they want to give up their time, how can they do that? Uh, also on our website, there's a way to go, but we need volunteers for everything. So we had somebody sorting um, jackets um, for our folks to come through because we give them vouchers to walk through the store, as we call it, and they can pick the size. So we separate them by size, all the donations. And so they get the opportunity to choose the jacket that they want um, from our you know, whatever we have in inventory. Um, so they can come help do things like that. We always need, you know, facilities, maintenance, painting, all those kinds of things. So our volunteer center, you can just click and fill out the form online. You can come as an individual or as a group. Um, and there's there's lots of stuff that can be done on a day, daily basis here at Haven. Havenforhope.org, where you can find some of those resources. I it's your second official day on the job, so we appreciate <laughs> you letting us put you on live television for KSAT Q&A and uh, wish you nothing but the best. We were big fans of Kenny Wilson, who uh, was your predecessor, so. Uh, big shoes to fill, yeah, absolutely. So we're excited and uh, keep us posted on what's happening over there. Will do, and thank you for starting all of this with your um, homelessness um, series that you did that, that Mr. Greedy watched and really changed the trajectory of our community. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you, Kim. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Just a few uh, lane closures and construction related things to tell you about. Uh, you know, the big project on Loop 1604 on the northwest side. We still have these uh, lane closures starting at 9, alternating between I 10 and Bandera Road in both directions. Current round runs through November 20th, so next week. Also have this construction this week on Loop 410 between Military and Marbach starting at 8, so a little more than an hour. That runs overnight. That runs this week as well. And then when you head up to State Highway 151 at Loop 410, some alternating lane closures right there at that interchange also beginning at 8. Taking a look at traffic otherwise this evening, traffic right now, things improving north of downtown on 35 but we still have some delays in the downtown area 17 minutes coming from loop 410 and then from the north from the southwest side to the north side 29 minutes had that crash there at nogalitos that is causing some issues as well also have this situation on 281 southbound at least the tow truck is there we can see uh, vehicles that's causing a bit of a slowdown so i'll give you one more view of that uh, this is the view from Hildebrand, so slow traffic coming in to downtown on 281 this evening. A common occurrence, guys. <laughs> All right, thanks, Sam. Look outside with live cam, 73 degrees right now. We are waiting on some changes to roll in, Sarah. Yeah, do you guys like the colder weather or do you prefer the warmer weather? Steve Myra. Oh, cooler. It, cooler. Depend, it depends on whether I'm growing a beard for No Shave November or not. <laughs> Which you are, so I'm going to guess cooler weather. Yes, you would be correct. All right, well, uh, we'll see a cold front move through at midnight tomorrow, and that'll shake things up. Outside right now, though, it's mild. You don't, you don't even need a jacket. It's in the 70s, and we're really not going to see temperatures fall all that much by the start of the day tomorrow. 62 degrees to start your day tomorrow with, once again, some areas of fog. But then at midnight tomorrow, a front is going to move through. That's going to take our morning lows from the 60s all the way down to the 40s, even in the uh, upper 30s in parts of the Hill Country. We'll talk about that front and whether or not we'll see any rain with it coming up after the break. If you are a fan of beer or local history, you don't want to miss tonight's case that explains live stream. Did you know that San Antonio has a history as a brew town? And the future looks set for it, too, with a variety of locally owned breweries all around the city. You can stream KSAT Explains San Antonio as a brew town tonight at 7 o'clock on KSAT.com, the KSAT TV app, and the KSAT Facebook page. Now, if you can't catch it live, we'll post the full video after the stream so you can watch it on demand whenever you'd like. I like the occasional adult beverage. You do? I like local history. Well, do I have something for Whoa. you to do at 7 o'clock? All right. <laughs> I have a date. Yep. All right. So uh, we have a lunar eclipse tonight. Are you going to talk about that some more? The lunar eclipse is actually a Thursday night, Friday, Thursday morning. night, Friday, early Friday okay. morning, early so we've Friday. Got, yeah, some stuff to wait on here. We got that. We do. 
and a cold front and a cold. and a cold front. And by the time the lunar eclipse happens early Friday morning, it's going to peak at 3 a.m. So if you want to stay up late, you can. It'll be in the 40s early Friday morning for mm. us. All better than the 80s, in my opinion, especially when it comes to November standards. We were in the 80s today. Let's take a look at the numbers. 81 degrees for the afternoon high. Uh, that is 10 degrees above the average. And earlier this morning, we were 14 degrees above the average low. We usually see a low temperature right around 50 degrees this time of year. We were at 64 and we had areas of fog. The reason for that is humidity is very high. Here's final weather fact. Temperature can never be below the dew point. So if you have a dew point of 60 degrees, temperature is not going to go below 60 degrees. You need something to take the humidity out of the air to lower the dew point, and that cold front is going to do it. But we have to get through one more day of warm and relatively muggy air. Uh, tomorrow morning, starting off with areas of fog, visibility could be less than a mile in many places, including San Antonio, New Braunfels, Lotus, Hondo, areas across the Hill Country, Kerrville and Bandera. Early morning fog, so if you have an early morning commute, it'll be a lot like the last couple of days here where you'll have to use those low beams uh, rather than the high beams to get to where you're going. And then looking at the future cast, visibility will be seeing it improve by the mid morning hours. And again, by 10, we won't have any fog left in the area and skies will then clear a lot like today we will end the day sunny with temperatures on the warm side. Out toward Del Rio could be up to 84 degrees, 86 in Catula, 82 in New Braunfels. It'll be near 82 here in San Antonio, 86 in Pleasanton, and temperatures across the hill country will top off right near 80 degrees. But it's a temporary warmth because we can already see our cold front on the way. That cold front is working its way through the northern Rockies there, producing some snow. And the same particular system produced wind gusts of up to 82 miles per hour out across parts of Washington, as well as some flooding. Now, we're not going to have a lot of rain with this front at all. In fact, it'll be hard to see anything on the radar when it moves through. But you can see just how cold this air mass is behind the front. Temperatures in the 40s in Idaho will be in the 40s by early Friday morning. Taking a look at that future cast again, a warm day tomorrow, but then right at about midnight, that's when that front's going to move through. And I do think that this particular computer model is giving a good representation of the lack of rainfall that we'll see with this front. Only a small chance, 20% for an isolated shower storm right at about midnight. So right when a lot of us are starting to head to bed and then we'll be looking at a, a very windy, windy day on Thursday, gusts of up to 40 miles per hour in spots. So light patio furniture, outdoor Christmas decorations going to really need to make sure those are anchored down and then we'll only be in the 60s on Thursday because clouds are going to stick around only on the 60s on Thursday and on Friday. But once again, tomorrow warm day for us. Patchy fog in the morning 62 76 around noon. We'll be seeing clearing skies south winds at 10 to 20 gusting up to 30 and a warm afternoon 82 degrees. There's that cold morning on Friday 45 degrees with those highs only in the 60s on Friday as well. A more mild weekend before a week front moves through on Monday. Steve, Myra, looking forward to the next front. Thank you, Sarah. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. Hey everybody, it is Tuesday. It is November 16th. Katrina, we understand firefighters actually had trouble getting into the home. Well, that's right. They said that uh, there was a lot of clutter inside the home that was impeding their path as they tried to move throughout the house. The fire seemed to start in the front room of the house. It's about halfway down this block. Uh, firefighters now uh, are packing up their equipment and starting to leave. The fire is out. There were two people home when the fire broke out around 4.30 this morning. A larger than expected crowd turned out in support of Beto O'Rourke, the first 2022 Texas gubernatorial Democratic candidate to stop in San Antonio. This is a great example of why I feel confident about our chances. A chance to turn the state blue with his top priorities that include voters' rights and health care in rural communities. Kyle Rittenhouse is facing life in prison, and it's up to 12 jurors to decide if he will. Earlier in court, the teenager was asked to draw juror numbers from this raffle-style box at random. Ultimately, seven women and five men, including one person of color, chosen to deliberate. Bit of Christmas downtown, the 2021 HEB Christmas tree jingling its way to Travis Park today. It comes all the way from northern Michigan and is a 50 
foot tall concrawler fir. The tree's going to be decorated with more than 10,000 lights and handmade ornaments. An in-person celebration at the tree's arrival will take place next Friday. And you can find more information on our website, ksat.com. <laughs> Crash at 281 and Grayson has cleared, but we're still seeing some residual delays, but they're dropping by the moment. 24 minutes on 281 from 1604 to downtown. Also watching still things on 35. The big problem is on 35 northbound approaching downtown. Still 25 minutes to get from Loop 410 past Highway 92 downtown. And here's a look at downtown on uh, Transkai. This is 35. It's in the shop. As you can see, the slow traffic moving there, Sarah. Thank you, Samuel. We'll have ditto weather tomorrow. Patchy fog in the early morning hours, 62 degrees, and we'll be looking at clearing skies in the morning, 76 around lunch, 82 for the afternoon high, sunny and warm. South winds gusting up to 30 miles per hour tomorrow. The one thing that will be different, cold front's going to arrive at midnight tomorrow. That's going to bring us a small chance for an isolated shower, but really the thing you'll notice more than anything, dropping temperatures, windy conditions, gust up to 40 miles per hour, and highs only in the 60s. All right, thanks, Sarah. Don't forget KSAT Explains live stream in a few minutes on KSAT.com. See you back here on the night beat at 10.